Welcome to the start of the American Antiquarian Society's Fall Virtual Public Program Series. My name is Kayla Hopper and I'm Director of Outreach at AAS. For those of you who have joined us for the public programs before, either in person or online, thanks for joining us again. For those who are new to AAS programs, we're so happy to have you joining us tonight. As we do likely have some people here who are new to us, let me quickly introduce the Antiquarian Society. We're a national research library of American history and culture whose mission is to collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the British West Indies before the 20th century. In doing so, we collect anything and everything printed within these parameters, from graphic prints and ephemera, to newspapers and periodicals, to pamphlets and books. We use these collections as the basis for all of our programs, such as the one tonight. Before I move on to introducing tonight's panelists, I want to go over how the program will be structured and point out a couple of features of Zoom webinar that we'll be using. During the first part of the program, each panelist will give a brief presentation on their topic, about 10 minutes apiece. This will be followed by a moderated discussion, which I'll be moderating, that will tie the topics together. Finally, we'll have a Q&A portion during which the panelists will field questions from all of you. We expect the program to run about an hour and 15 minutes in total. For the public Q&A portion of the program, where we'll be taking questions from you, we'll be using the dedicated Q&A function in Zoom, not the chat box. By using the Q&A function, we'll better be able to keep track of questions, plus it has an upvote function. So if someone posts a question you want to see discussed, be sure to upvote it to help get it to the top of the queue. Also, just a note that if your question is directed toward a certain panelist, please make that clear in your question. Due to the large number of attendees, the chat box uh, is only going to be used for informational purposes. So we'll be posting relevant links and information there, so keep an eye on that. And you can contact us as presenters if there's any technical difficulties that we should know about. If you would like to save the chat to save the links for future use so that you can get back to them, you can save a transcription of the chat box by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. I also just want to note that my colleague Jim Moran is uh, behind the scenes helping me out tonight. He's helping to moderate the chat and the Q&A. So thanks, Jim, and you should all should expect to see his name in those places. All right, now for tonight's program. So we're very excited to have these three panelists together tonight to talk about past epidemics from a variety of time periods, places, and perspectives. While I know we could all use a break from the constant barrage of information and talking about COVID, we also couldn't resist the opportunity to reflect on the current pandemic from a very AAS angle, printing. Each of the case studies that will be presented tonight highlight different ways of thinking about the connection between printing and diseases in the past, which in turn, of course, provoke new ways of thinking about our current situation. So I'm now going to ask all of the panelists to turn on their video so that I can introduce each of them. All right. So we're going to begin our formal presentations uh, with David Paul Nord, who is Professor Emeritus of Journalism and Adjunct Professor Emeritus of History at Indiana University. Uh, Dave will be followed by Sarah Schutze, who is Assistant Professor of English and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And finally, Kelly Wisecup uh, will conclude. Kelly is the Associate Professor of English and Affiliate of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research at Northwestern University. Dave uh, is an AS member and both Kelly and Sarah are past AS fellows. So it's a real pleasure to have each of them back with AS tonight. So I'm going to now ask Kelly and Sarah to turn off their video again, momentarily. And uh, Dave, you can turn on your microphone, unmute yourself, and you can get started. Okay, thank you, Kayla. Well, thank you very much and welcome to all of you. It looks like a large group out there. It's different to talk to a screen instead of to the group in an aquarium hall, but it's, it'll work, I think. I'd like to talk with you tonight about two epidemics in 18th century America, one in 1735-36, and that was diphtheria in New England. The other was a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793. And I'm gonna focus on the role of media, print media, of course, in those days, and a particular kind of content 
of print media, journalism. And by journalism, I mean content that deals with current events that are of public importance and disease epidemics uh, fit that bill perfectly. And the role of journalism is twofold. And to put it very simply, there's a fact function in journalism, which is to find out what's going on and report it. And there's a forum function, which is to analyze it, discuss it, argue about it. And uh, journalism in media plays both those roles. And in the 18th century, in both of these epidemics, uh, newspapers were involved. But newspapers were much more important in 1793 than in uh, 1735. But there was journalism in both eras, and that's what I want to talk about. So let me tell you very briefly the story of each of these epidemics, very briefly, because we'll come back to things over the course of the evening. Uh, in 1735, news of, of a serious illness began to come out of the towns of southern New Hampshire and the Merrimack Valley and the Boston that was particularly lethal to children. And newspapers sometimes reported bits and pieces of this, but they picked up just little bits and didn't say much about it uh, as newspapers did. They didn't do serious reporting. But there were two people in Boston at that time who tried to do what I would call serious public affairs reporting. One of these was William Douglas, a physician, and the other was Daniel Henchman, a publisher and bookseller. And both of them sought to, to, uh, to gather news in a way that was somewhat unusual at that time, and that is to send out formal questionnaires to ministers and doctors in the outlying towns. Uh, both of them were interested in data. They were interested in numbers of people who contracted the disease. They were interested in rates of death at different ages. They were gathering demographic and epidemiological data without really quite thinking that that's what they were doing. And it was journalism they were interested in the sense that they were going to were interested in publishing this in Boston so that people would know what was going on. And they did, sort of, but they didn't get a lot of their questionnaires returned. Uh, but they did some use of it, and I'll come back to that. I'll show you a few pictures in a few minutes. The other disease uh, that I want to talk about is the Philadelphia yellow fever of 1793. That is a pretty famous epidemic because it was so lethal. Philadelphia was the largest city in the country at the time. It was the capital of Pennsylvania and of the United States. And uh, this was a serious lethal disease that killed about 10% of the population of the city, even though many of the people left. The city of about 50,000, four or 5,000 died of yellow fever. And newspapers played an important role in that epidemic. Newspapers in general played a more important role in cities by 1790s than they had 60 or 100, 60 or more years earlier. Uh, Philadelphia, for example, had eight newspapers in 1793, and four of them were dailies. And dailies hadn't existed five years or so before that. And Philadelphia was the place where the daily newspaper started. Many people left town including newspaper publishers. And uh, one newspaper, however, stayed in business, the Federal Gazette. And it published every day during the, the months of the epidemic in the fall of 1793. And the roles that it played was very interesting to me as a journalism historian. Uh, the elites of Philadelphia sought very early to commandeer the, the newspaper for their use. Uh, the doctors, public officials, to deliver the kind of top-down information that they had in mind. Uh, but ordinary people sent in things to the newspaper as well. Uh, the doctors argued about, about what ought to be done about the disease, and they argued in public in the newspapers, and they got pretty vicious in their arguments. And the readers of the newspaper 
were kind of horrified by that and panicked by the doctors' disputes in the newspaper. So they wrote in to complain about the doctors arguing, but they also wrote in to tell their own stories, to give their own ideas about cures and, and ways to avoid the disease, and uh, to send in prayers, thanksgivings, uh, and maybe even a little humor from time to time. So the newspaper in 1793 had very much a fact function and in some ways a top-down fact function, but it also uh, had a forum function for acting out community life while people were locked down in their houses, much like social media today, and the newspaper played that role. So let me, uh, if I can do it here, I'm gonna share my screen with, with you so that you can see some pictures. So this is, what you're seeing here is the um, cover page of William Douglas's book. Uh, it's called A Practical History, but in I don't think I'm actually, I'm not sure that I'm, no, I am sharing the screen. I see it now. Let me, let me go back. This is the cover page of um, William Douglas's book, uh, which calls itself a history, but it, and it is an epidemiological, epidemiological history, but it's also a piece of journalism that was published in 1736 while the disease was still underway for the purpose of bringing this information to the public at that time. Here's a look at what the, uh, questionnaire that Daniel Henchman sent out uh, looked like. It was printed and it was sent to the, to the uh, ministers in the outlying towns of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. And they were asked to fill out the form and send it back to Henchman. And here's an example of one filled out. Some of these forms uh, were saved, not all of them, but about 17 of them are saved are in the, and are in the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society. And that's where I got this. This one comes from Bradford, which is now part of, of Haverhill. And it was used, some of this material was used in a book about the epidemic put out by Daniel Henchman about Haverhill and the disease there. And here's a page from that book with some tables. Here's the, here's the Philadelphia newspaper that I was talking about, which is the Federal Gazette. And like all newspapers, particularly commercial papers, the front page was all ads. But inside was a lot of information about the epidemic, including information from the mayor and from other city officials. This is a very simple little note uh, saying that those who have been entrusted with the care of the homes belonging to citizens who have removed to the country are requested to send their fire buckets uh, that are belonging to those families to the courthouse where they will be placed under the care of the constable of the watch and be ready for the use in case of fire. So this is just protocols of how to deal with, with disease when people are whole up in their homes or leaving. Uh, the doctors wrote a lot for the newspaper in, about cures and sometimes advertise their cures. These are two ads from the paper from Dr. Benjamin Rush about his, his mercury purging and sweating powders advertised by two uh, pharmacists in the city of Philadelphia. And then a last example of uh, a letter just from an ordinary person Uh, just an ordinary person writing in to the editor, Andrew Brown, saying, Mr. Brown, is every observation on the present prevailing disorder founded on fact may have its use, you will please publish the following. And he writes about his experiences and how he discovered that molasses was a very efficacious remedy to yellow fever. He drank a lot of it. He had a lot of gas, a lot of flatulence, and it, it seemed to cure him. 
So the newspaper was full of all kinds of things, both from the top down and from bottom up, much as today we get our, our information top down, but in social media from bottom up as well. So I'll stop there. We can talk more about this a little bit later. So I will stop sharing and I will turn it over back to Kayla. All right. Uh, thank you, David. And now we're going to turn it over to Sarah next. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, just to make sure. All right. Um, everybody, thanks for being here. Um, my main research on cholera in 1832 has been on the fear of cholera and the relationship between the spread of fear and the extensive publication of cholera related items in popular periodicals, including newspapers. I argue that any epidemic really leads to a surge of production in the primary print or textual form that was significant to the circulation of information at the time, especially information about the disease in question. And cholera is no different, except that it, incur it occurred in 1832 during a key growth phase of print technology and publication production. So there is a vast cholera archive. Um, in this talk, however, I want to emphasize what's extraordinary about the print culture of cholera in 1832. Through the popular press, cholera has a voice. It spoke, it warned, it threatened, it boasted, it described itself on the pages of texts such as uh, the, the New York Mirror, the Rochester Gem, and the Rural Repository, among others. Um, as they collected, arranged, and printed the, the voice of cholera, editors were presented as liaisons to the disease, albeit in its imaginative form. But seeing as the medical professionals at the time lacked understanding of cholera's nature, impact, and means of transmission, those with access to its imagined voice could claim authority and expertise about cholera. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and yeah, look at some slides here as I talk. Okay. All right. This is the, some examples from that vast cholera archive that I mentioned. Um, the first example that I want to share of cholera speaking through the press is called A Warning from Cholera. The version I read was published in the Rochester Gem in July 1832. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share the transcription that I'm going to read of this, this um, little excerpt. Um, a warning from the cholera. The following rather humorous warning upon this subject may perhaps do more actual good than advice in more serious garb. It was addressed to the editor of the Taunton Courier. And the passage, the quoted material is, Sir, as I am at present residing on the shores of the Baltic and may probably soon pay a visit to my friends in England, I have thought it best to send beforehand to your columns a slight sketch of my history and proceedings. My father, who is a well-known old serpent, named me cholera by way of signifying sympathy and regard for the gross and choleric portion of mankind. I am particularly attached to everything my parent has a hand in, consorting always whatever country I inhabit with the promoters of any kind of evil and iniquity. The profligate, the drunkards, the gluttons, the lazy, the dirty, the quarrelsome, may be sure I will find out their abode. But this I must observe that if a man be industrious, sober, and temperate, I shall have nothing to say to him. If he rise early, open the windows, wash himself from head to foot, whitewash off in his house, take his meals with his family, and give himself always in good humor with his neighbors, such an one I cannot abide. I pass by his cheerful hearth and heart to, re to revel in the rotten liver of drunkards and to stir about the boiling bile of the sulky, the discontented, and the litigious. I am, sir, yours truly, cholera morbus. 
The addition and the reference at, that be at the beginning here to uh, the, another editor emphasizes the editors as voices of authority. The additional comment even suggests the statement is humorous, um, but that it could do more good than what we may perceive it to be advice coming from medical professionals, which would be advice in more serious garb. Um, publications like the Rochester Gem, which published that, also printed and reprinted at least a dozen poems relating to cholera, some of which are in the voice of the disease and, um, and provide an in-depth uh, characterization of the disease. Aside from the subject, poems written in cholera's voice share a number of features. Um, cholera in these poems makes no apologies for its destruction. It's frequently likened to a powerful ruler, even a tyrant set on enlarging his empire of victims across the earth. Cholera's body as a source of infection appeared in some examples and contributed to the impression of the disease as a supernatural force that attacked through contamination and consumption. Even though there were variations on the characterization of cholera in these poems, they participated in constructing a common image of the disease as supernatural, destructive, bombastic, and, in, and insatiable. They also address cholera's ability to battle doctors who were no match for it. Um, as unlike them, it did not claim any earthly origin and seemed to command natural forces like air and light. Instead, cholera recognized itself as a god, making nature tremble. In selecting, arranging, perhaps even writing, printing, and reprinting these poems, editors had the power to disseminate these detailed, albeit fantastic, portrayals of cholera that professed to answer the questions of its nature, its impact, and its means of transmission, those, those three major unknowns. One example of a popular periodical that printed horrible accounts, tantalizingly horrible accounts of cholera was the New York Mirror. Author and editor Nathaniel Parker Willis played an active role in its production and contributed to the contents as well. In the spring and summer of 1832, Willis was traveling abroad, dispatching letters and articles to the mirror where they were published under the heading First Impressions of Europe. Two of his letters included details about the presence of cholera in Paris before it reached the US. In, in June of, of 1832 is when it first landed in North America. Therefore, Willis provided firsthand knowledge and even contact with cholera before most other Americans. In one of these two letters uh, that deal with cholera, Willis details his visit to a cholera hospital. He told readers that his visit was impelled by a powerful motive, which is not necessarily to explain. If the narrator of Willis's cholera hospital account were a doctor and not an editor, his powerful motive to explore cholera might seem like an intellectual pursuit. Many doctors were trying to get closer to cholera to try to figure out how to answer the questions of what it did, what it, its impact was, how to treat it, etc. Willis had neither medical expertise no any, nor any affinity with the medical profession as the questions he asked the doctors suggest or demonstrate. Instead, Willis uh, acted on the authority of an, uh, of an editor for a publication among many that created and profited on cholera's fantastic and terrifying characteristics. Um, this, what's on your screen right now is one reproduction of, of the, a walk through a cholera hospital, which is part of, of one of Willis's cholera letters. Um, and I'll give, I, I'm going to point out some parts of that text in a moment. And I'll, I'll share some transcriptions. So don't worry about trying to uh, narrow your gaze on those tiny, tiny words. Willis managed to get across, uh, uh, sorry, Willis managed to get access to the hospital through an English doctor um, whom he followed through the ward past beds holding the sick and the dead. The severe environment of the hospital and the doctor's treatment of the patients caused the editor to wonder if the, quote, fright and horror of being a patient there was not enough to kill a far less ill patient than the ones he saw. 
upon witnessing the, the quote, heartless manner of a celebrated doctor, his rude handling of, of patients and hardly answering questions, Willis thought the doctor's administration administered not medicine, but quote, discouragement and despair. And perhaps for this reason, Willis crossed the boundaries of a visitor and seemed to act he really started to behave as a doctor or a nurse or some kind of advocate for the patients himself on this tour. Uh, he, des he describes a point at which he appeared to be without his guide and wandering alone. Um, and Willis wrote, and this is a part I'm going to share and read, I passed down the ward and found 19 or 20 in the last agonies of death. They lay perfectly still and seemed benumbed. I felt the limbs of several and found them quite cold. The stomach only had a little warmth. I found two who must have been dead half an hour, undiscovered by the attendants. One of them was an old woman, nearly gray, with a very bad expression of face, who was perfectly cold, limp, lips, limbs, body, and all. I want to draw our attention to the fact that Willis described what he noticed upon touching the patients he encountered. He touched their lips, their limbs, their stomachs, and body. And remember, he said he touched several, um, and uh, body and all, whatever that could mean. Something no editor should be expected to do. While his text suggests concern for the patients he's touching, he surely is also invested in making the most vivid account for his readers who can touch the disease for themselves through his words. Sorry if my, I'm, my pages get in the way of the camera. Um, Willis edited, ended sorry, his account with frustration about the medical professionals he encountered when he wrote, Quote, my blood boiled from the beginning to the end of this melancholy visit. Distrust of, like Willis's, of medical professionals at this time could be observed through the pages of popular periodicals during the epidemic in the US. As a means to combat this, and I'm oh, sorry, yeah. As a means to combat this and disseminate information about the disease, such as they had to share, a group of New York doctors published, compiled, a periodical called the Cholera Bulletin. And in Philadelphia, a similar publication called the Cholera Gazette was developed. Doctors wrote and edited both journals. Their formats were similar to each other and consisted of case studies, autopsy reports, personal accounts, treatment options, death counts, and other details concerning the contemporaneous epidemic. In writing these journals, uh, and in writing in these journals often replicated the hyperbolic metaphoric language and characterization of cholera as a villainous monster evident in other popular periodicals, including the poems that we uh, that I um, talked about. In fact, both journals reprinted articles, stories, even poems published in their non medical counterparts, but unlike the non-medical periodicals on their pages, doctors were the heroes. But it appears that to do so, they had to first borrow the authority of editors. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, that's all for me. I'll go ahead and unshare my screen. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and now we will have Kelly come on. Thanks, Kayla. Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to be with you tonight and I'm really happy to be in conversation with Sarah and David. I am uh, speaking to you from Chicago on Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi lands. And it is nice to be virtually at the AAS. Um, thanks to Kayla and to Jim for the work they did to put this program together. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you and start my PowerPoint here. Okay, um, the role of illness in the conquest and settlement of the Americas may be well known to you, especially if you have read popular historical accounts such as Charles Mann's book, 1491, or the Abenaki poet Cheryl Savageau's poems about smallpox in her 2006 collection, Mother Slash Land. 
or maybe more recently you've taken a look at the New York Times's COVID-19 data, which shows the disproportionate number of cases, of COVID cases, in Native American communities in both cities and on reservations, as well as disproportionate numbers of cases in Latino and Black communities. This is a health disparity caused in no small part by settler colonialism, including the violence and disruption of war and enslavement, forced removals and environmental destruction and extraction. The relationship between disease and colonialism was no secret in colonial accounts either. To take just two examples, colonists acknowledged that illness factored significantly in Tenochtitlan's conquest by Spanish forces. You may know this place today as Mexico City, as well as in English colonist settlement in 1620 on Wampanoag homelands that they claimed were empty and renamed Plymouth Colony. Um, and this is despite the fact that merely four years earlier, the English explorer John Smith had depicted a busy populous place and advised prospective colonists against settlement there. These colonial narratives are for some readers, the primary records of the diseases that affected indigenous nations. Texts by Hernan Cortez, William Black Bradford, Edward Winslow, and Thomas Morton, among others, appear in course anthologies and in scholarly and popular histories. Um, and this year in 2020, when people are remembering the Plymouth colonists arrival on Wampanoag homelands, it's put many of these texts back even more visibly in the public eye. But these colonial histories also create narratives of absence and scarcity. They claim inaccurately that disease emptied indigenous lands, creating a void into which colonists could justifiably settle and detaching illness from the colonial bodies and domesticated animals that carried them. At the same time, the focus from scholars and the public on colonial accounts of disease and their destruction in indigenous communities sometimes leaves the impression that we lack indigenous accounts of these events. So today I want to consider pestilence and print um, by reading work by some 19th century indigenous intellectuals with you. These writers turn to print archives and to print production as two among several tools for addressing the legacy and ongoing consequences of disease and colonialism for their communities. And there are three critical moves that these, in, that these indigenous intellectuals made that I wanna to foreground today. First, indigenous intellectuals insisted on seeing disease not as an isolated or solitary phenomenon, but, but as a facet of colonialism that affected multiple areas of indigenous life, from physical and social health to the lands, waters, and resources on which indigenous people relied to live. Two, to trace these legacies, indigenous writers read trans historically by critically interpreting a print archive of colonial histories that colonists were also themselves reprinting and recovering in the 19th century. Um, and you can see Lindsay de Circe's great recent new book on that history. Um, indigenous intellectuals drew as well on indigenous histories, memory, and oral traditions in order to describe 16th and 17th century epidemics and their ongoing effects. And then finally, indigenous intellectuals highlighted print not as a departure from, but as a continuation of indigenous media and practices of inscription. So I'll talk about one main example in my short talk uh, by taking you uh, with me to Chicago, where the Potawatomi leader and writer Simon Polkagan told stories of illness by bringing print together with indigenous practices of using birch bark as a surface for inscription. In 1893, Polkagan printed a pamphlet on birch bark pages, and he issued it under two titles, The Red Man's Rebuke and The Red Man's Greeting. And the AAS, as you can see, has a copy of the rebuke. Polkagan circulated the pamphlets at the 1893 Columbian Exposition and Chicago World's Fair, an enormous exposition that sprawled over 600 acres on the city's south side and hosted 27 million visitors over about a year. The 1893 fair was dedicated to celebrating the 400th anniversary of Columbus's so-called discovery of America, as well as Chicago's reputation as a Midwestern site of industry and what fair organizers called progress. So I wanna first talk us through the physical qualities of the pamphlet. Um, these images might suggest that the pamphlet's fairly large, but it's actually about the size of my hand. So it's small enough to slide into a pocket. It's an ideal size for selling at the fair as Pokagan did. <clears throat> 
Um, as I said, the pamphlet's printed on birch bark and the pages, as Pokagan uh, draws attention to early on in the pamphlet, are thin, tough, and paper-like. There are also some variations in the pages um, as copies, and these are two from libraries at the University of Michigan, um, show they have the traces of tree knots um, and the bark patterns differ as well across the different copies. Um, because of the birch bark pages and its engravings, the pamphlet quickly became a collector's item in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, people were really drawn to its material form and to its engravings. But today I want to argue that in order to understand the significance of the pamphlet's material form, we need to consider its content. Pokagan declared at the pamphlet's opening that indigenous people could not share in the fair's celebration of Columbus. And he wrote, sooner would we hold high joy day over the graves of our departed fathers than to celebrate our own funeral, the discovery of America. Pokagan elaborates on discovery as a funeral by discussing the various maladies the European colonists brought to indigenous lands, making the point that bodily disease accompanied the destruction and dispossession of indigenous lands. He wrote later on, they brought among us fatal diseases that our fathers knew not of. Our medicine men tried in vain to check the deadly plague, but they themselves died and our people fell as fall the leaves before the autumn's blast. Pokagan then links these diseases to what he calls a cyclone of civilization. That is, he puts it, rolled westward. The forests of untold centuries were swept away, streams dried up, lakes fell back from their ancient bounds, and all our fathers once loved to gaze upon was destroyed, defaced, or marred, except the sun, moon, and starry skies above, which the great spirit in his wisdom hung beyond their reach. So Pokagan's description of colonialism as a cyclone that affects indigenous people's bodies, as well as forests, streams, and lakes, made clear that diseases were one part of an apocalyptic attack on indigenous people's bodies, homelands, and food. What Pokagan describes deforestation, changing water levels, the filling in of streams and lakes to make arable lands might sound like some of the causes and effects of climate change that are quite familiar to us now. Pokagan links a changing climate and deadly plague to the things that settlers like to call civilization, a, pro a process he re-describes as defacing and marring indigenous lands. The pamphlet's birch bark pages are all the more significant in the context of Pokagan's description of environmental destruction. He located his detailed accounting of colonialism's effects on a material that Potawatomi people used for centuries and still use for many purposes, to make dishes, bo boxes, baskets, canoes, and homes. Here's just an example of some recent items made with birch bark. Um, birch bark is not merely a resource. It's also a material in a system of relations. And a material, as Pokagan elsewhere explains, the Potawatomi people used to cement social relations among indigenous nations. So by printing the rebuke on birch bark, Pokagan locates his history of colonialism, diseases, and climate change literally on Potawatomi homelands, insisting that readers contemplate the birch bark pages as more than a curiosity or collectible, and to grapple on a material level with colonials, colonialism's destruction of native people's bodies and homelands. Finally, Pokagan doesn't simply diagnose the cyclone of civilization in order to lament its effects or to weep at the funeral of indigenous people and homelands. Instead, he calls for readers to change how we read histories of colonialism and disease. In a passage that might seem paradoxical, but I think is important for us to consider carefully, Pokagan calls on readers to pause here, close your eyes, shut out from your heart all prejudice against our race, and honestly consider the above records penned by the pale-faced historians centuries ago. Tell us in the name of eternal truth and by all that is sacred and dear to mankind, was there ever a people without the slightest reason of offense, more treacherously imprisoned and scourged than we have been? Pokagan's call here to close our eyes might seem a strange one, but when we consider that the colonial histories he references were teaching readers to see the past through narratives of progress and indigenous people within racial categories, the call takes on new meanings. Closing our eyes, Pokagan suggests, allows readers to be critical of narratives of scarcity or invisibility 
and instead to foreground Indigenous experiences of disease, their connections to climate change and colonialism, and to recognize how Indigenous people have survived and are surviving those attacks on bodies, lands, and waters. Um, so I'll stop there and look forward to our conversation. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Sarah and Dave to also now bring back their video um, and their uh, microphones. Um, just a reminder to everybody, we're going to move into the moderated discussion part now. But while we're doing that, please do feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box um, and upvote other questions you see that you would like to, to see rise to the top of the queue. Um, and we look forward to taking those questions in a little bit. Um, and again, if you if there is a certain question for a certain panelist, just make sure that um, that's clear in your question. All right, so <laughs> it's been really great to kind of get these you know quick overviews, but we want to dig a little deeper. Um, before we do that, though, we we want to answer the the most obvious question. We brought you all here together to talk about a topic that's on everyone's mind. Um, but each of you started your work on these topics long before COVID-19. So now that we're in this moment, how, how has the current situation changed the ways in which you think about your, your research? Um, if it has actually changed how you think about your research? Uh, why don't we just start with state? We'll kind of go in a similar order since uh, it will just be easier to go around the table. Okay, yeah. What I first thought about when we were locked down and kids were out of school and were doing school work online is the way in which people in Philadelphia during the yellow fever who were in a similar situation uh, used the newspaper and letters, by the way. I didn't talk about that, but a lot of letter writing. Uh, and I, for that reason, I began to think about what I had done in the past through the the, the lens of social media. I, I hadn't used that term when I did this years ago because it was just getting started. I've always been kind of optimistic about social media until recently, I'm less optimistic. And uh, I think that there can be too much of it. And, uh, and I think that happened even in a, in a way in April or so is, is that we're doing it right now. I mean, here we are uh, on Zoom as people have been on Zoom doing all kinds of things. And the people in Philadelphia in 1793 would have loved to have had Zoom, but uh, after a while you begin to miss real physical contact. And, and that happened then too. Uh, people were insistent on going, to, they thought yellow fever was communicable in an ordinary contagious way, many people did. And so they refused to stay home. Uh, they, if they didn't leave town, they often went to church and and we're going to go to church regardless of whether they were told not to. Now, does that sound familiar uh, in 2020? So there's a lot of similarities to the way in which people use media to do personal things, but at the same time, really do miss real contact and, and, and real connection. Uh, and then in, in epidemics, that can, that can be hot spots as we know. Not, that wasn't turned out not to be quite the case with yellow fever, which they didn't fully understand, but that's what they thought. Um, my, my research is, it really focuses on fear, as I mentioned, and so when um, this, this unfolded, it was very familiar in a very strange way. I, I was recognizing the things around me that I've been studying for close to a decade. So that was fascinating and scary and <laughs> gratifying in a very peculiar way. But what I wasn't expecting to see was kind of the coexistence of fear and hope, which isn't something I came across in my research at all. But in the spring in particular, I think there was a real um, thrust of of hope or a surge of, of hope. This is when the rainbow hearts started to get put up in people's windows so, so people could recognize hope around them. Um, and that, that was fascinating to me that those things could coexist. Um, and now that, you know, we're in month six or seven, whatever it is, I don't even know, um, 
it, this, this certainly exceeds any of the research that I've done because none of the diseases that I study persisted with this kind of degree of acute infection and, and circulation for so long. So what I'm finding fascinating is the way that that fear changes. Um, and I'm sure somebody in the audience knows the, the biological terminology, the technical terminology about what happens in the brain, because you, you can't sustain fear in the same kind of way um, for very long. You adapt, you get used to it. And, and I think we're really seeing a lot of that. The things that people were really afraid of, people have kind of learned to live with or lost their um, anxiety about. And now it's, it's fascinating to see how fear becomes politicized, that if you're, you're um, cautious about, about not catching the virus, then you're feeding into fear, or you're buying into fear, which has a political um, discourse associated with it too. So it, it's evolving all the time. And I don't know in a year from now how it will evolve more, but I'm sure it will continue to change because there's just, um, there's no way to foresee where we're going to go from here at this point. Just picking up on Sarah's point about uh, no way to see sort of where we go. One of the first things I did in March when I thought like catching up on my reading would be a way to deal with uh, the stay at home um, was to read a, a novel by the writer Wapgishig Rice, Moon of the Crusted Snow. It's an apocalyptic novel um, by an indigenous writer um, and that imagines uh, what is maybe not the end of the world, but is definitely a kind of radical change to the ways in which people have been living. So it was very strange to read that at a moment when it felt like our world was changing very quickly and it was really impossible to know what would happen. Um, and one of the things that that and and thinking about Polkagan over the last couple of um, years as well has helped me think about is the, the move that Polkagan makes to read trans historically and to understand um, the late 19th century by looking back to the 16th and 17th centuries to emphasize that those histories are ongoing and have long legacies that have not ended, um, legacies of um, epidemics that accompanied some of the first European arrivals um, in the Americas, but that certainly were not limited to those moments, but continued throughout the 18th, 19th, 20th, and now we see 21st century. Um, so, to, so for me as somebody trained as an early Americanist in an early period to think about those long contemporary legacies um, of the events that we study in the past, I think was really brought home um, by the world that we're all living in now. Um, and, but also to, to understand that understanding those past moments is also really important for understanding our present. Um, so that that kind of transhistorical reading looks in both directions. All right. I, I, Kelly, had a similar experience where I was reading a novel that was based in like the 1660s England of, with the plague. And I had started reading it before this happened. And then I was in the middle of it in the lockdowns. And it's, it's a strange experience for sure. Um, all right. So next question. Uh, so, and you, you kind of touched on this, each of you, in your, your way, in, in your first answers. But each of you take a different approach to how print was important. So whether it was through newsprint, whether it was through literary interpret interpretations, or through these histories. And so how did you come to be interested in these topics in the first place? Was it an interest in the diseases themselves? Was it an interest in how people reacted to them? Just what drew you to these? Should I start? Yes. Yeah. Well, my... I, I'm a historian of journalism and also a kind of urban historian. And so I'm interested in the role of journalism and media in urban life and city life. And I wasn't particularly interested in, in disease, but disease in a city concentrates public life in a way that produces a huge outpouring of communication. And in a way, then, it generates sources for studying uh, communication history, for studying the history of journalism, the history of communities, life in a city. Uh, so in Philadelphia, then, uh, when people during that, that, that was such a tremendous event, 
that people tended to save material related to it. I mean, of course, we would have the newspapers like and books like you have in the AAS library. There's a lot of letters and diaries that uh, are saved from that period. And in those letters and diaries are discussions that are related to understanding how people use this newspaper, for example. So my interest as a, as a journalism historian has always been an interest in how journalism was used and readers. So I, I call myself also history of readers and reading. And what I really like is when readers talk about their reading and say things about what they doubt, what they like, what they don't like, what they're, makes them fearful, uh, you know, anything where I see how they're using the media in their lives. Well, these epidemics just concentrate that into a single place. So I could go to Philadelphia, for example, and go to every library in Philadelphia and look at anything that, that is related to the second half of 1793. And it would have something to do with these events in Philadelphia. And it really gave me a window on what people were talking about, thinking about, arguing about, crying about, uh, because they talked about it and they wrote about it. Like, like Dave, I didn't enter into the research that I, that I do out of an interest in disease initially. As a literary uh, scholar, I'm, I was interested in a literary form and I was, I was trying to decide what I wanted to study for my dissertation and I was drawn to Gothic literature, um, and which is, is not known to be the most uh, erudite form of literature in, in literary studies, but um, I was fascinated by the construction of fear and how readers learn to recognize something that is meant to invoke fear for them. Um, and in, in doing this research, I started to notice that diseases were used to provoke fear or to represent fear in narratives um, that and that's something that readers would recognize as a source of something to be afraid of um, it's sort of like like the scary music of, of, a, of a scary or the eerie music of a scary movie you know that there there's a signal there when you encounter a disease in one of these novels so as I was um, I'm very interested in that. And so it just kind of spread into understanding or wanting to understand more about the construction of the fear of illness, how it's circulated, how people learn to recognize diseases as, as fearsome, and what about particular diseases generates fear, or what about each individual disease that I study is, is something to be afraid of. Um, and through that, you know, my work has brought me into not very non-literary kinds of works, um, medical texts, uh, graphic imagery, maps, things like that, that also replicate kind of an emotional um, legacy that's related to, to disease and, and help to generate and, and confirm that these are scary things. So. All right, slow getting to my unmute button. Um, I love, Sarah, thinking about the kind of print culture of fear, which is, uh, I hadn't kind of thought about it in those terms before. Um, so, you know, I, one of the, the questions that's interested me for a long time is about how diseases are represented and what the consequences of those representations are. Um, so I think like David, I'm interested in how people write about disease um, and, and also how reading about it might affect people. Um, and so for, um, the work with Pokagon and to think about um, indigenous peoples, how indigenous people are represented um, as sometimes ill and then also how they take up um, forms of representation in order to try to control narratives about disease. One of the things I think about on the kind of really broadest level are the issues of invisibility that indigenous people face today. Um, around the ways that our educational systems, our cityscapes. So I think about the public art in Chicago that represents indigenous people largely as confined to the 19th century um, or as a mascot. Um, the ways in which those systems perpetuate these ideas about invisibility and also about um, death uh, and deficiency as I sort of gestured to in my talk. Um, so one of the things as somebody who works in indigenous studies um, and in early American studies that I have tried to do is to think about 
the kind of long lasting consequences of those early representations and how across the 19th century and even into the 21st, um, disease can be used as a way to kind of perpetuate or generate these narratives of invisibility. Um, I think it's also important to counter the the analysis um, of those um, representations with attention to the ways that, of course, Indigenous people are not invisible and did not die. These are not the only stories, um, a kind of death and, and trauma and loss. So what, that's one of the reasons I think Pokagon is so important, because he is so um, carefully using this moment at the World's Fair um, to really kind of make a strong argument about visibility and about survival and about continuation. Um, and I will, you know, one of the things that took me to Pokagon was moving to Chicago six years ago and wanting to learn more about um, the history and the print culture of this place as it was shaped by indigenous peoples. Um, so if folks are interested in kind of thinking about the histories of places and invisibility, I'll just give you two more book recommendations. Um, so one is John Lau's um, imprints, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians and the city of Chicago. Um, John Lau is a, a member of the Pokagon Potawatomi Nation, and it's a great history of Chicago. And then if folks are in uh, the Northeast, you may know of Lisa Brooks's new book, Our Beloved Kin, um, A New History of King Philip's War. That's also really great for thinking about um, these narratives of invisibility and also um, disease and, and uh, war as well. All right, so uh, we have a lot of questions now going in the chat, but so we'll turn to that um, in just a second. We just want to kind of close out this uh, discussion portion, talking a little bit about the ways um, that your sources are playing into your your topic. So each of you have touched on that. You know, Dave, you mentioned how there's so many sources for for the other people. Mm -hmm. Fever, right? Um, and you know, Kelly, you just mentioned how um, you came you came to that topic somewhat based on such an interesting source, right? So um, we also want to put that in context in terms of what AAS does, right? That uh, as an archive and as a special collection, um, we're we're collecting, right? But there's always those gaps that that don't get collected, that don't represent. Um, everybody and only represents certain perspectives. Um, and so just want to talk a little bit about that, um, how these kinds of questions about what was saved from earlier epidemics, what wasn't, whose voices were most prevalent, and uh, how institutions might play a role in that uh, is also another question. Uh, and as I said, you know, I, I don't want to go too far because I want to make sure we have time for other questions, but I just want to give a chance to kind of get a, a little bit again at kind of the specific sources. Well, I, th I think it, the role that, that, it, that AAS can play is it, in the current COVID crisis is a little harder to see than the role that a, uh, say a state historical society would do. I, in my state, Indiana, which has a very good state historical society, has a very good project underway of gathering people's stories and they ask for stories and they they even collect video, are collecting videos uh, the idea being to tell the story of of the covid crisis of 2020 later uh, the aas uh, runs out its time in seven, in 1876 so uh, i'm not quite sure what the aas should be doing but I do know that, that one of the things that makes a, an epidemic like this valuable for vo finding voices is what I said before about that uh, a lot of things are saved. And so uh, material about what ordinary people might have, have said or done and written in letters and how they use print media or so forth, a diary, a diary that was not about a disease epidemic might have been thrown away um, 200 years ago, but it might still be around now because it's so striking. It's just the way Civil War diaries and letters exist. So do epidemic diaries and letters. So it would be nice to, um, to not always have it be a crisis that causes places like the Indiana Historical Society to save material. And I, I don't think it is. I mean, I think that that a, a state society that's prepared, that's collecting things for today, for the future, 
uh, sometimes does kind of do a random sample of, of, of things that are going on. And, and that's, what, that's what we kind of need. I'm not sure that the AAS can do that. I, I love the idea of collecting stories. And often I found myself and still find myself wishing that there are more stories of, of people who experience diseases that I study in the past. Um, and some of that is just the reality of, of illness and the, the disabling effect of it. Not everybody is, is telling their stories or recording their stories. Um, it can be physically difficult in some of these these um, diseases to to do that, let alone um, the focus or the energy to want to record what you're experiencing. And I, I wish that there was more of that. Um, and so that's definitely been a, 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 a black hole sort of in my in in my research and I think in the archive, but it's not necessarily about collecting. It's it kind of brings the physical reality of disease into it, which I think is really valuable when we're talking about archives is just the, the physical um, bodies that go into creating the materials and collecting and then also accessing them too. Um, and um, so th because of the kind of, sh by comparison, the, the few number of, or the, yeah, the fewer number of, of resources told firsthand from, from sick people, I often am using um, doctors discourse, doctors writing, and, and that is something that gets collected quite a bit. And it becomes valuable for um, popular audiences depending on the disease, um, but doctors often refer back to past accounts of diseases when something new happens to try to understand how to respond to it. And we see that today too, even just in, amongst popular um, memory of people thinking back to SARS or the, the swine flu epidemic of H1N1, you know, there's kind of a, a, a almost like a generation of disease that that gets invoked. You know, the past disease is important, um, uh, and I think for for collecting today, one artifact that I think should be collected and tell tells incredible stories are masks. You know, they are. There's a almost like a print culture of masks now. If I look on Facebook, it's every variety of bizarro print that you can imagine comes up, um, and you know they're of course they're highly fraught, politicized things as well. Um, so I think I think there's something fascinating to that. So hopefully in a couple of years that will be an article or something like that. You know, I think one of the things that's so interesting about Pokagon and other indigenous intellectuals in the 19th century is that they are turning to the colonial histories that places like the AAS um, are starting to collect um, after 1812. Um, and they're rereading those histories and they're using them to write their own histories of uh, indigenous people in the Americas. William Apis is another great example of this, the Pequot intellectual. And I'm thinking about his 1836 eulogy on King Philip. Um, which another AAS fellow, Dan Raddus, showed APIS actually gave in Worcester, um, I believe in 1836. And APIS is very similarly to Pokagon, reading colonial histories and both using them to kind of reconstruct a history um, in, in APIS's case of uh, New England and the Northeast and King Philip's War, um, but also to tell a history about the role of diseases um, in colonialism and in um, uh, Wampanoag people's experiences of colonialism, as well as in uh, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay um, colonists um, settlement. And so I think there's a really interesting history of rereading the materials that places like the AAS are collecting and also kind of rereading of the archive itself from that indigenous perspective um, that, that we see all the way from 1836 up to 1893 and beyond. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question. Um, just thinking about your work and what what was saved then and what may or may not be saved now and, and kind of the, the vast amount of material that that could be right. So it's great that there are a lot of projects that are kind of taking that on. Um, so now I want to turn to the Q&A where we have a lot of activity going on. And the first question uh, is for Kelly. So uh, they want to know more about the actual printing on the birch 
part about the process. Do we know if the printing took place in a, you know, what we think of as like a normal print shop? Um, was Pokagon involved? Um, is there any reason why the birch bark itself would have been turned horizontally or vertically? Because it seems like the pattern goes both ways, depending. So just anything you can tell us about that process. Thanks for that question, Katie Childs. Um, we know that um, the, the pamphlets were produced through letterpress. We know that Pokagon works with a lawyer and friend, Cineas H. Engel, E-N-G-L-E. -E. Um, he lives near Engel in Michigan. Um, and aside from that, I don't have a lot of details, unfortunately, um, about um, how the actual production happened. But I will say that um, the Red Man's Greeting and Rebuke were only um, one title out of many that Pokagon published or printed on Birch Bark. Um, and so it's definitely something that he um, did throughout the course of his um, printing, mostly in the 1890s. Um, and so it's, it's not a kind of one-off thing, but it's a kind of part of a practice that he's engaging in. Um, the pamphlets are, are bound with green or yellow ribbons um, that appear in some of the copies that are extant today and, and in others, the ribbons are not there. Um, and you know, I, my guess is that the patterns of the um, bark have to do with sort of how the bark from the tree would have been harvested and then how the particular piece was pulled out of the bark. Um, but unfortunately, um, at, at least to my knowledge, there isn't a lot of information about the actual process that Pokagon would have engaged in with Ingle. Um, although I will say that that um, lots of Potawatomi people um, within the state of Michigan where Pokagon lived would have been harvesting birch bark and making not necessarily pages, but baskets and other objects. Um, so it's possible that it was a collaborative process involving Ingle, but also other Potawatomi people. Um, and, a, and a larger community of folks who were certainly using birch bark um, for lots of different purposes. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Mary Beth Norton and she asks, uh, specifically first she asks Dave, did yellow fever ever quote unquote speak as cholera did later? Um, and then following up on that, Sarah, when did the personification of disease was it cholera? Did you, have you seen it earlier? Um, so I guess we can start to get at that question with Dave if you've done, see any, have seen anything similar. Um, and then that's, Gary, a, that's a wonderful question, a fascinating question. I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> I, I did. I don't remember coming across that in the in the uh, the materials that I read. But on the other hand, I I wasn't paying attention to to uh, writing much writings about the uh, yellow fever epidemic in, in the years after 1793 when people might have done that. But I didn't see that as a kind of journalistic thing, that is of speaking right to the suffering people at that time. But I, I don't think it would be unknown in, to do something like that in the 1790s, although it does sound a little more like 1830s kind of chit chat. <laughs> It's definitely, oh, yeah, it's definitely very pervasive in, in 1830s. Yeah. There, I, I came across at least one of, of yellow fever, but I think it was a religious tract. It's more of in the pamphlet literature, um, and, but it wasn't as common. So there wasn't such a collaborative character creation like there is in 1832. And I love your question, um, Mary Beth. And, I do attribute it to the time period and the print history at the time because again print his print was exploding and what was really common was were sensationalist characters and stock characters um, stock sensational characters come from kind of an urban tradition because they're often associated with urban spaces so are mass-produced popular periodicals so I think there's a real association there that's, that's my own theory um, because there doesn't seem to be that that intersection or again that collaborative creation of a character elsewhere and also the characterization is such a bizarre mix of um kind of delight or attraction and also horror so there's there's also a, a weird mixing of the emotions about the disease at that time that you don't see as as much elsewhere or universally elsewhere Thank you for that wonderful question. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we have another one here for Dave. Um, how cooperative, oh, this is a question about the, uh, the questionnaires that were sent out. So uh, Tamara Thornton is wondering how cooperative were respondents with the quantitative agenda of the questionnaire? Did they add qualitative information as well? Did it elaborate on uh, what they could find out quantitatively? And so just kind of getting at this question of was there any agreement on how to tell the story of the epidemic or were people trying to kind of tell their own story in a different way than the questionnaires wanted them to? Well, th that's a good question because uh, the two men that I talked about, Douglas and Henchman, uh, wanted the same kind of numbers. They wanted the same numbers of the incidence of illness, numbers of deaths and so forth. And they had spaces on, to write if, in the printed versions of these. Uh, but they, they, did want, they did want case studies. And uh, what Douglas wanted, he was a doctor and he wanted medical case histories. He wanted to do an effect clinical analysis at a distance where he couldn't go. He was doing this in Boston, uh, but he couldn't do it out in the countryside. So he asked these for detailed descriptions of cases. Uh, Henchman was interested in a more religious angle, which, uh, which is also a kind of more commercial angle because he was interested in publishing a book that would have uh, particularly the stories of, of Di uh, repentant dying children to, in their last words that would be a good a good seller in a book about the the, uh, the epidemic. So he asked for those kinds of stories. Neither of these men got the kind of stories and histories that they wanted, uh, and they didn't have as many questionnaires returned as they wanted. Uh, if Douglas had gotten a few more case histories, he, he came very close to discovering this is, I'll add this that I didn't mention before, but it seems likely given the data that he collected and a little bit collected later by modern epidemiologists that there was a different disease in Boston compared to what was going on in New Hampshire and Mary Mack River towns. It was diphtheria out of Boston and it was scarlet fever in Boston because the incidence of death uh, was much lower in Boston. And, the, and, and Douglas was very puzzled by that, but he didn't get enough clinical studies in order to quite make that judgment. He, he came close. And uh, Henchman really didn't get enough of, of his stories about pious children, uh, some, but anyway, they did want, uh, stories as well as numbers. Seems like a very human kind of uh, response, right? That you mm -hmm. want those stories as well as just the numbers yeah. of what's happening. Um, so this is a question directed toward Sarah, but I, I think anyone could really kind of jump in on this one as well. Um, this is from Paul Herr, I believe is how you pronounce the name. Um, during the cholera epidemic, did anyone think that the actual distribution of print could physically transmit the disease? Um, and thinking along a similar line, have you found that any analogies between cholera and the spread of information or spread of ideas? So kind of print as virality kind mm -hmm. of metaphor. Yeah, this is great. I love this question, and you're probably going to have to cut me off at some point. Because <laughs> there, there are definitely diseases that the circulation of information were were connected to the disease, or there was fear that that information could um, could physically travel on uh, on the uh, the disease could travel on the on the the, the paper. Um, that's not the case with cholera in in kind of a, a literal sense in terms of handling would make you sick, but there, there was a strong belief in what was called um, um, just the fear of cholera. It, it, it had a, 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 another name for it um, that I'm drawing a blank on, of course, at the moment, but um, there, the, the fear was that if you thought about it, then you could you could make yourself sick with cholera, um, and it, it could look very much like it. And the, the thought was 
this information that's circulating about the disease, if you read it, you're going to make yourself afraid of it, and then you're going to invoke it in your own body. Um, and there was just just a ton of information written and circulating about it. Um, I was going to use a quote in my talk earlier that I ended up cutting, but um, one person wrote, everyone has his brain and his abdomen and his mouth full of cholera. And they they talked about a mania for publication during the, the, the epidemic. And um, one person even referred to cholera manufactories or the the press as these manufacturers of the disease be through through fear. So it, it, it comes through fear that it would circulate through the print, but um, it's definitely related. All right, I'll stop myself there. With yellow fever, I'll just say quickly, very little concern about spreading yellow fever by, by paper. Uh, some people thought maybe and smoked, uh, put the paper in smoke but not very much. Uh, yellow fever was very confusing about, about its contagion because it seemed to be contagious person to person in a way, but it also seemed to have a kind of environmental uh, connection too. Now we know that, that what's involved is a vector, uh, an insect vector, a mosquito, which obviously has an environmental connection. P certain parts of town are more likely to have have a yellow fever, but it also seems to have a, a person to person one, and so it was very confusing. People were confused, but they tended not to think that that it could be transmitted by paper. Uh, the newspaper, one of the things that it did was circulated out of Philadelphia. The stagecoaches were going back and forth. A, to, between New York and, and Philadelphia and taking Philadelphia newspapers and mail to, to New York. And uh, nobody thought that they should be stopped. People, yes, but not, not, not mail or papers. It's interesting that we're still having the same conversation, right? I mean, years and years and years later, and that question of, should you touch your mail? Should you not touch your mail? I mean, I just wow. wanted to know that some people have when they get, have gotten books from the library, they put them in the uh, microwave to disinfect them. And if they, have, if they have a magnetic strip in them, the microwave will set them on fire. Sure, yeah. And there's all, even at AAS, you know, anything that we're doing now, there's all kinds of protocols about, you know, people coming back and all kinds of, so yeah, it's, that's definitely a library question for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're running out of time. So I'm going to take one more question. But I just want to let everybody know that um, if we didn't get to your question, there's just so many great questions, which is so hard. But um, all of the panelists tonight have agreed to give you their email addresses. So in the chat, you can find all of their email addresses. Feel free to email them with your question um, after the program, and they'll be happy to get back to you. To so the last, the last question tonight is for all the panelists, and it's a question about visual print culture. So satirical cartoons, prints. Um, how, what role did visual culture play in the conversation of disease? And if you have, if you, any of you happen to have some, or even when I talk about an object that you already, you know, saw, that you already showed us in a visual way, you know, that'd be great if there's anything um, to share in that way. I won't say much here, I don't think. And the, the 18th century didn't have the kind of vivid visual culture that developed by the by the 1820s so just to save time i'll pass my pass the baton here to sarah who is in the rise of real wonderful visual culture in popular culture in the 18th i wish it was rising more <laughs> sorry i cut you off david um i i wish that i had encountered more illustrations of diseases i was i was expecting to um and I didn't, I think it comes after the time period that I stop. Um, in the later part of, of the 19th century, you can, um, you encounter more uh, kind of illustrations of sick women in, in writing about um, uh, tuberculosis. Sometimes you'll encounter uh, drawings or illustrations of sick children too, and they all kind of have a, um, a, a particular focus and a case of kind of sparking um, uh, um, empathy or grief. Um, but I was looking for the scary disease representation. Mm -hmm. I have one in my, in my 
in my talk that I share, but it comes actually much later in, in a later episode of the, the epidemic. Um, I can share quickly a map that I mentioned. Um, I mentioned maps just briefly, but there, there is a, a map or a couple of maps that I found really helpful and um, interesting. This is a fold-out map or a map that was included in the cover page of a treatise on cholera that was written for doctors and popular audiences in 1832. So you can see on the left there this that the, the map folded in to tuck inside of the front cover. And when you unfold it, it is a map of, of the, the world with illustration of the movement of cholera. But what I found really fascinating when I did the work on this was that these lines are hand drawn. So there are printed lines mapping it, but the red is drawn in after by hand. Um, and I found that really exciting. Um, this is a great copy that's at the AAS and they're kind of hard to come by, but I found this really wonderful because it's an objective tool as a map that that shows a desire and labor of kind of creating an emotional response or cap capturing um, kind of an, an affect, right, in, in something um, that measures. Um, so that was, that was kind of exciting to discover. And I, I spent some time looking at other versions of that. There are a couple of them, actually. There are quite a few, but not many that still survive, so. That's awesome, Sarah. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been sort of trying to do tonight is to say that disease is a central part of colonialism and early American history and early indigenous history in the Americas, but also that it's one piece of a whole set of, um, you know, networked issues and effects on people. Um, and so I think my answer is also going to be a little bit adjacent to the, to the question about visual culture and representing disease because um, the thing I would say is that the images I'm thinking about are perhaps not of disease, but are part of this work that Pokagon and other indigenous intellectuals are doing in the 19th century, both to retell histories of colonization and the years after from an indigenous perspective and to put disease in those histories, but also refuse to allow people to um, reproduce those narratives of invisibility and banishing. And so I would take us back to um, the, sorry, just sharing my screen. Um, I would take us back to the image I showed just as a like, here's an engraving from um, Pokagon's pamphlet um, to talk a little bit about what we see here. And I'm not sure how well you can see it, um, but this is an image of the Chicago River as it comes in off of Lake Michigan. And one of the important things about this image is that Pokagon is taking a map that has appeared um, about 60, 50 or 60 years earlier um, in an account of the so-called um, massacre, Fort Dearborn Massacre. It's a battle, it happens during the War of 1812. It's between Potawatomi warriors and US warriors, um, but the print culture of the time recasts it as a massacre. And the map as it appears in that earlier account um, is, uh, marks out the houses where um, European traders live and then just represents a kind of vast expanse of emptiness. And so one thing we see in that earlier map is the ways that the very early 17th, uh, 16th and 17th century narratives of um, erasure and of emptiness of lands kind of waiting to be settled um, gets reproduced again in the 19th century. And so Polkagan here is representing um, the distinctive river, the distinctive tea that the Chicago River makes, but he's putting indigenous homes alongside the river. So you might be able to see the little um, triangles, which are homes. And then there are people in canoes in the river, indigenous people in canoes in the river. So he's depicting this very urban, very populated place that is uh, an indigenous homeland. And so if this is not a representation of disease per se, I think it's part of this important um, visual um, print culture that indigenous intellectuals are producing in the 19th century by rereading these colonial histories and archives in order to correct their inaccuracies and to tell a very different story that positions disease in relationship to climate change and um, a lot of other uh, effects on indigenous people. Great. Thanks, all of you, uh, for sharing those last thoughts. 
and I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. As I mentioned, um, if you still want to ask your question, feel free to email the panelists. The, uh, their emails are in the chat box. Also in the chat box, you'll see a couple of links. If you're not yet on our mailing list, feel free. There's a form there that you can fill out to get on our mailing list for upcoming programs. We'll be announcing our October programs next week. Um, so keep an eye out for that on email, social media, our website, all of, all of those good places. Um, and just a reminder that if you want to save the chat to get those links, you can do that by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. Uh, so thank you, all three of you, for joining us. This was a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad that we were able to make it happen. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank you. everybody, for coming. Thanks, Kayla. David and Sarah, it was great to hear your work. You too. It was a pleasure, everybody. Thank you.